Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Turkey will hold its presidential and parliamentary elections on Sunday the 24th in what arguably is the most important election in Turkey's modern history. To discuss the campaign, the main contenders, and analyze the viable implications of the election's outcome, I'm joined here in the studio by Ms. Paula Slier, who is the Middle East Bureau Chief at Russia Today. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Dr. Eran Lerman, who is the Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategic Studies and a lecturer at Chilim College. Welcome. Mr. Oren, give us a broader understanding of who are the contenders and what is currently happening in Turkey. Sunday's elections uh, could turn out to be one of uh, the most important, even seminal events in Turkey's modern history, because uh, what is at stake here is whether uh, Erdogan is going to become uh, the uh, supreme leader of Turkey um, with no other um, bars on his uh, hold uh, for power, or whether the opposition can unite the various parties, some four parties. Um, you have uh, the, the Kurdish party, uh, which uh, should uh, cross its own 10% uh, bar and three other uh, parties. Of course, they are rivals between themselves, but they have vowed that in the second round, whoever becomes number two, if Erdogan gets less than 50%, they will unite behind him. And for the first time in many years, there is the chance that they could, at least democratically, topple Erdogan. Whether he will accept the verdict of the people remains to be seen. But is that a true reality in which President Recep Tayyip Erdogan seems to uh, people both in Israel as well as across the West as a powerful leader who has the backing of more than 50% of the country, which is a, a substantive majority for years upon years. Of course, uh, there was one mishap when Ahmed Avutoglu at the time uh, tried to uh, uh, be elected as prime minister, but lost the 50%. And then there was a snap election once again, where he did succeed. To what degree is this balance of power shifting from Erdogan's pocket into pockets of other contenders? Look, the situation in Turkey is that the polls are notoriously unreliable. So if one looks at the polls, the suggestion is that he will not win the presidential part of the election and there'll need to be a second round. However, he is touted to win that. The polls also suggest that in terms of the parliamentary election, his party will not come in with a majority. But it begs the question what really changes on the ground. I think it's accurate to say that one of the reasons he called for the snap elections was to catch the opposition unprepared so that perhaps they might not have enough time to put forward a viable campaign. The irony is that they've actually done quite well. But it also begs the question, why would a totalitarian leader even want to have elections? I mean, what is actually going to change? And the important point to make here is that the Turkish people very much believe in the idea of democracy. There was another poll that again has the question mark over it, but something like 86% of Turks believe in the idea of democracy and want to feel that they are contributing and living in a democratic country, despite the fact that Turkey's never been democratic. So for the, the advantage for Erdogan in calling such an election is that if he wins it and, he, and, he's, and he's touted too, it has the veneer of legitimacy. So it's as if he was elected by a democratic election. And it also quietens the opposition, if you like, because they partaking in the election. So it gives him the legitimacy he seeks. And all he really needs is a very small majority to actually have the credibility that he won another election in Turkey. Dr. Lerman? Well, I think that... Uh, I agree that this is very difficult to predict, but I think that the, with the AKP base on one side, there is a base on the other side, um, maybe a third, uh, but a very significant third of the Turkish population for whom the direction in which Erdogan has been taking Turkey is increasingly frightening. And um, these, these happen to be the productive elements and those who are the, the drivers of the Turkish economy, particularly in the uh, western and southern provinces of Turkey. Uh, clearly, it's been very good to the um, inner Anatolian uh, hinterland. He has been very good to the people moving from the Gece Kondus to the uh, high rises uh, in, in the big cities. But there is a core, a significant core of people in Turkey who fear uh, his direction. And the question is, 
whether things may happen that will enable them to capture elements that have in, in recent years have voted with AK. And uh, the economy may be the key here. Mm -hmm. The economy is also the reason I believe that Erdogan cannot take the final steps, not in uh, his, uh, servicing his regional ambitions and not in turning Turkey into a non-democratic state because the consequences very quickly would be the collapse of Turkey's ability, uh, which is already becoming precarious, to do business with the West and doing business in, with the West, not the options uh, every, anywhere else are limited, doing business with the West, doing business in Europe, has been the core of what turned Turkey into a success story in the last 15 years. The, the, slide, the slide in the uh, value of the Turkish lira towards the five to one dollar mark uh, has been uh, quite frightening uh, for the Turks. So there was uh, a slight uh, uh, a turn in this uh, trend, but nevertheless, it's a downward trend it's 4.7 per and, and more. And uh, in the days before Sunday, and uh, even more important, in the days bef between Sunday and July the 8th, if the trend keeps downward, it will so frighten the uh, Turkish electorate that this could seal Erdogan's fate. Now, so it uh, always, um, when you are approaching an election, it's a matter of timing, uh, whether uh, something happens the day before the election or the day after when it is uh, too late. So uh, me, we may be in for some tabular times. Nevertheless, we've seen the lira as much as it's uh, been deteriorating over the last uh, several months, uh, if not uh, more than a year. Uh, there is or there have been some measures which uh, the central bank in Turkey has taken in order to try and thwart uh, further deterioration. It had succeeded a little bit in, in slowing it down, if you but, will. But economy is psychology. It's mm -hmm. not just a matter of what the International Monetary Fund would have uh, uh, dictated here or recommended. And um, to take uh, a very imperfect uh, analogy, in 1984, when Yitzhak Shamir was in power, the economy deteriorated uh, in the same uh, uh, way. There was uh, hyperinflation. And this is why Shamir eventually lost or came in with a tie with, with Shimon Peres. And, and when you have uh, a frightened electorate, not knowing what will happen once the election is over, they tend to uh, vote the incumbents out. Uh, Ms. Lear, there's been reported some violence uh, in uh, several uh, uh, rallies in several uh, places between the various factions. Of course, the AKE party is the most significant one of uh, President uh, Erdogan. But uh, we don't hear as much rhetoric from President Erdogan as in preceding years. To what degree has this to do with a lack of confidence or overconfidence? These elections are happening under a state of emergency that was put in place after the attempted coup back in 2016. So that really gives the president a lot of leeway in terms of how he is running the campaigns up and until the election. Uh, there's a lot of complaints from the opposition, for example, that there's intimidation at their rallies, that they're not given the same kind of airtime that he is given. You have, for example, the leader of the HDP, the Kurdish party, who was sitting in prison mm -hmm. and who was only given 10 minutes on television because he, he is afforded that because he's running for presidency. But other than that, he has no access to the media and has to rely on social media and on really other leaders within the party. A lot of people are also saying whether or not there'll be any kind of vote rigging. That the fact of the matter is that the institutions are in place, are controlled by Erdogan such that he will win this election. If he thinks he doesn't, he can immediately employ intimidation or vote rigging or any kind of other measures to ensure his success. But it's, it's questionable whether he even needs to do that because he's been in power for so long and because he's managed to capitalize on the institutions in Turkey. So the violence has the rhetoric where perhaps he doesn't even need to comment on it. Very often there, are, there is speculation that, that there are things happening behind the scenes and that people are, that, that, that his rhetoric is inciting. And, and I've read some reports even on, on the verge of actually encouraging people, voters, to go out and, and physically attack opposition. But he doesn't really need to respond to that because he really mm -hmm. controls the apparatus so much in Turkey. Dr. Lerman? Well, g given that there is a religious edge to the party cleavage, 
that Ake looks uh, supporters as we see them in the streets, see themselves as upholding Islam. They see the direction that Turkey has been, uh, the, the course that Turkey has been on in the Kemalist era as essentially taking it away from the true faith. It's easy to slide, I mean, to slide, uh, it's easier to slide from politics to violence when this, there's an undertow mm. of, uh, of religious authority and incitement. Uh, this is probably why it was so uh, important for Erdogan to basically crush the Gulen movement, because the Gulen movement basically makes the case uh, against his bid for power from within the religious discourse. So um, uh, th th all of this lends this election, as uh, Amir said, uh, an air of uh, unusual importance. Mm. Mr. Uh, Owen. Uh, one of the major questions uh, following um, the vote. Um, supposed uh, Erdogan seems to have lost by a very small margin and decides to take action. Uh, and uh, mind you, this is the first time that he is running as an executive president. Uh, the, the entire idea when he moved from the prime ministership to the presidency, which was um, earlier mostly symbolic, was to concentrate power in his own hands as a president. But suppose um, he loses. What happens with the military? He has purged the military uh, uh, even before the coup and obviously after that, and we are fast approaching the two-year mark. But we have seen in a similar situation in Egypt when Mohamed Morsi, uh, who uh, much like uh, Erdogan uh, comes from, from the same school of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, appointed military commanders who uh, he believed were his uh, uh, co-patriots uh, or compatriots in, in co-religionists, such as Abdel Fattah Hassisi and, uh, and Sidki uh, Subhi. And they turned out to be more faithful to the military and to the idea of Egypt as a nation. This could also happen in Turkey, even though uh, several strata of military commanders have been purged for the last 15 years. It is not only those from 2016. But nevertheless, we can find ourselves, again, with the Turkish military as the guardian of democracy. So um, one, one should not, even though he has purged not only the military, but also the judiciary and school teachers and the police and, and every other institution, nevertheless, we can find vestiges of Kemalism, as uh, Dr. Lehmann put it. So we uh, shouldn't be too quick to dismiss uh, the military as the all. guardian of democracy in Turkey. Not at all. Ms. Lear, I'd like to ask you about the Turkish uh, population across the globe. Of course, we have a lot of uh, Turkish citizens uh, living in uh, Australia and Germany and elsewhere, uh, something that uh, uh, is, of course, uh, considered to be a strong base for President Erdogan, considering also the fact that they're not affected by any economic uh, challenges or other domestic issues. To what degree uh, does Erdogan still receive the support from Turks uh, living abroad? And uh, do we see also a shift among them as it uh, is seen in Turkey? It really depends which Turks you're talking about. If, if we follow on from the Turks who were your secularists and your professors and, 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 and the ilk of that kind, certainly not. In, Turkey is ranked as one of the top five countries that's lost the most number of millionaires, something like 500% increase from 2015 to 2016. In the UK, for example, 40% of students who apply for short-term student visas are Turkish. So there's this huge withdrawal and exodus from Turkey of educated, financially well-off people. And certainly they're leaving because they don't foresee a Turkey under, uh, under Erdogan and they don't want to be part of it. And their options are quite limited in terms of either face imprisonment or face potentially house house arrest or whatever. So there, there's no support from them for Erdogan. But then again, with, within the, the populations that, that do support Erdogan, that support will continue and it will have a significant impact. But again, you know, we, we're, we're talking about numbers really when the, the overall sense is that he is going to win again, whether it's in a first round or a second round. And I just wanted to add on to Amir's comment. There's also a question mark over what happens if he loses the majority in the parliament and his executive <coughs> 
powers, he can dissolve the parliament and he can call for a new parliamentary election, which means that his party will be given a second chance to actually win a majority in the parliament. But the risk again there is that that could potentially plunge Turkey into even more uncertainty. And perhaps even a civil war. Dr. Lerman? I wouldn't go as far as to talk about a civil war. For that, you need um, a well-armed party. And the AK, at the end of the day, relies on the institutions of the state. And I think I, I tend to agree with Amir that despite all that has been done to purge and re, repopulate the, deep, the Turkish deep state, uh, it still exists. And it will not lend its authority. It, it, it did not lend its authority to the coup planners in 2016 because they were illegitimate. And they will not lend their authority to a bid by other one to undo the system that brought him to power. But beyond that, um, I think that there is a clear sense at, uh, at, at his part. And I, I look at the people he um, promoted in recent years um, that you need to sustain legitimacy because Turkey is one of the G20. G Turkey is full, is full has, has flowered economically in the last 20 years because of its relations with the international community, because its truck drivers are the ones who, who cover the roads in Europe, because its manufacturers go to markets everywhere around the world. By the way, including Israel, you, you know, you, we all noticed that even at the depth of the Mavi Marmara crisis, he kept the entire economic interaction off, off the reservation. And in fact, uh, these were the years in which we finalized the relationship between Israel, Turkey, and Jordan, when, you know, that Haifa services Turkey as its port of call for, for, the, for Jordan and, and, uh, and the Gulf. Mm -hmm. So he never crossed that threshold uh, to go down the road to full autocracy, not a semi-legitimized, uh, semi -legitimized, semi-democratic autocracy, the one as we see now, but uh, the, the real McCoy. No elections, no respect for the result of elections, dissolving parliament, uh, uh, repressing uh, the opposition, uh, even worse than has already happened. This has very real risks for that economic uh, achievements that have made him into what he is now. Of course, it will question a lot of investors when it comes to uh, uh, dealings with Turkey. Nevertheless, the situation of Turkey in the 90s and uh, throughout that period uh, until uh, the early 2000s when Erdogan did indeed take power has shifted a significant inflation period where a lot of people still remember a challenging uh, uh, life at least uh, to a degree that uh, there was mass immigration from Turkey towards Europe and elsewhere. To what degree do the Turks still living today in Turkey remember those difficult times? And do they still uh, grant President Erdogan with a certain uh, 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 command uh, of the capacity of being able to take Turkey out of those difficult periods? So, gratitude is a very uh, profound human trait. Uh, but uh, politics are rarely based on it. Um, it, it can hold for a, for a short while. Uh, people do appreciate. And I think, I think that, that it's a legitimate position. AK did more for the downtrodden, uh, the masses that lived in unspeakable conditions in the periphery of Istanbul and Ankara over the last 15 years than any Turkish government before that. And that, uh, that is, is the base, that, that is what created his powerful base. But uh, as soon as he comes to be perceived as putting this at risk, is, is putting the Turkish economy into a tailspin. Um, enough of this will evaporate in other directions. Mr. Um, this brings to mind um, a couple of famous uh, uh, British uh, uh, slogans uh, which made their way into global politics. One is, you've never had it so good in the 60s, uh, the Conservative Party, but then they lost uh, the election to Labour. And the other one, which still holds, and uh, which is why Iran uh, is so uh, correct, is that the question any voter asks uh, himself or herself is, what have you done for me lately? Not what have you done for me 
historically, but what have you done for me lately? And what is the conclusion that I should draw from that for uh, the near future? Now, Erdogan has been in power for 16 years now. That's almost a whole generation. A new generation of Turks uh, has grown up uh, during this time. They don't really remember what happened in the 1990s, and they don't really care. And to add another point, you asked earlier uh, about uh, the uh, immigrants, the uh, Gastarbeiters in, in Germany and elsewhere. The downside of their support for Erdogan, as we have seen in the uh, Soccer World Cup, where several members of the German team of Turkish extraction pledged loyalty to Erdogan. The downside is that they are considered a fifth column in their host countries, and this alienates Turkey from those Western European countries even more. So what you gain in domestic support, you pay in foreign policy. You know that in the Netherlands, for example, there is now a, an Erdoganist party that broke with the socialists, or two, two uh, members, two members of, a, indeed. of a Kurdish Mm -hmm. of a Turkish background, rebelled against the pro-Kurdish position of SP mm -hmm. and, and ended up uh, putting Denk together. That's the uh, unique uh, situation, but it could spread. But I, you know, ha having been to an iftar with Gulenists um, uh, in the States, I have, I have a sense that quite a number of the expats are not necessarily, and I'm putting it mildly, Erdogan acolytes. Ms. Lear? But I think the fact of the matter is that he's still the most popular politician in Turkey today. And you talk about recent memory serving that. Part of the reason that's put forward as to why he called for these snap elections one and a half years earlier is because of recent military successes, for example, across the board in the Afrin region in Syria. There's a general sense in Turkey that the Turkish army is winning against the PKK, that the Turks regard as a terrorist organization, the, the Kurdish fighters there. There's also a lot of bad words and tension between Turkey and its Western allies, particularly the United States and Greece, and that feeds into popularity on the ground. So that must have been part of the reckoning as to why he called for these early elections as well. And Erdogan's shift uh, towards Russia and Iran, to what degree does that actually improve his image among Turks? Well, it certainly improves his image around, amongst the, the Russians. They're taking full advantage of the bad relationship that exists now between the Turks and, and the Americans. I think, they, they, again, I, I seem to keep quoting polls, but, and then I tell you that they're unreliable. But there was another poll done that said something like 40% of Turks believe Russia over the United States. And there certainly is a shift within the Turkish population away from the United States and towards Russia. And Russia is welcoming that shift. For Russia, a closer relationship with Turkey gives them more of a footprint in the Middle East. Both of them have a common distrust in the Americans. And for the, the Turks, they can keep playing, if you can call it the Russian card. They can look for concessions with the Western world by moving closer to Russia. And there was just now a, an announcement that the S-400 missile defense systems is a closed deal. That was the announcement from the Turkish mm. government and mm -hmm. that they're going to be sold to the Turks from the Russians. But but uh, because of that, the F-35 deal comes into question. Come into question in, in the U.S. Congress, which, which uh, became, for the first time, there's serious moves in Congress mm -hmm. to block a major deal. This and is a 10 billion business for American industries. And the very idea that this could be uh, debatable Mm -hmm. tells you that Erdogan's stock in, in, in Washington in is the Senate, at its yeah. lowest. I, I, in, in the Senate, it's, it's uh, almost uh, gone already. But when you look at the House of Representatives and you, you see the letters signed by several dozen congressmen. Both Democrats and Republicans. Right. You see Absolutely. Greek names and Jewish names. Hmm. You see the, the new anti-Turkish coalition, which is quite a change because earlier there was an Israeli-Turkish coalition when the Greeks were so uh, powerful in Congress that Turkey had to look for an ally and found it in American jury. I'd like also to touch quickly Three. before the end of the program as we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, Mr. Ogan, we're, uh, Turkey has been a member of NATO, one of the oldest members of this alliance. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, turning its back towards the United States and, and other European allies has also hindered its uh, ability to bolster its uh, positioning within NATO. Uh, nevertheless, we did see uh, uh, Foreign Minister Mevlüce Vusoglu and uh, other Turkish officials trying to butter up uh, General Stoltenberg and, and uh, holding joint uh, press conferences and discussing various uh, joint maneuvering with NATO and Turkish military forces. 
to what degree is this uh, shifting more and more towards the east, or is there some kind of hope for Turkey to remain part of this mm. uh, alliance? Why was Turkey uh, such an early member of NATO? Because it looked back into history in which it was allied with Germany. It was neutral in World War II, but it was pro-German neutral. And it feared Russia, or later the Soviet Union. So it uh, went under the American umbrella uh, because uh, of the uh, concern that Russia was expanding. But once containment became the coin of the realm in NATO, and once the Cold War was over and the Soviet Union was no longer there, the threat evaporated. And then um, Turkey started uh, to reassess its position. And as was said here, it is uh, less pro-American than uh, pro-Russian now. Well, we're drawing near to the end of the program, so I'd like to give each and every one of you a, a closing sentence. Ms. Lear, we'll start with you. These elections are important, although the it seems a foregone conclusion what, what is going to transpire. But for many in the opposition, they feel it's really their last attempt to put the wheels on what is essentially Erdogan's descent into a totalitarian state. So there is still some hope amongst the opposition who've managed to mount a, a much stronger campaign than, than Erdogan himself expected. And there is still some hope amongst the opposition camp that they will be able to have some impact. Dr. Leoma? It's very important for the West, by the way, to signal that uh, Erdogan's behavior, posture, and ideological orientation are unacceptable. Uh, what happened in Afrin is unacceptable. And um, if the F-35s uh, are used basically just to send that signal to the Turkish people uh, uh, in between now and the next round, that could have an impact. Because at the end of the day, nobody wants to vote his country into an ongoing crisis with the West. Mr. Owen? Uh, there are three practical options, um, discounting uh, the idea that an opposition uh, leader could win in the first round, which is hypothetical. <coughs> it's not going to happen. Either Erdogan wins this coming Sunday, and there is no need for a runoff, or he goes into the round. And then two other options. He wins in the runoff, or he loses in the runoff. If either of the first two options transpire, we will say, of course, it was a foregone conclusion. This is why he called the snap election. But if the third option uh, is realized, then we will say, of course, the uh, Turks have grown tired of him. It was in the cards. Mm -hmm. um, how long can such a ruler cling to power? So we will sit here a few weeks from now and we will choose either of the options in hindsight. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank Ms. Lear, Mr. Oren, and Dr. Lerman for coming here today. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time. TV7 Israel's mission is to give you, our viewers, truthful information, which in effect will give you a chance to really understand what is happening in Israel and its region. If you are blessed by our programs and believe our mission to be important, we urge you to support us and become a voice for Israel. You can support us by going to our website at tv7israelnews.com. This program was made possible through your donations.